So it's part five of five. It's the fifth weekend of July. It's the fifth weekend of our five weekend kind of surprise series on the heart. And we've all been enjoying this together. It's been something I believe that God has done in our midst because of what many of us fear is the, the condition of our hearts, the poor condition of our hearts. Did you get your, your crayon and your three by five card? Hold them up. Let me just see if you got them. All right. You didn't lose it yet? You didn't? All right. <laughs> All right. Just put those away. We'll look at those in a moment. All right. Pray with me if you would. Father God, in Jesus' name, we give you thanks that all that we're doing is intended by you to reach our hearts, that our hearts are uh, your entry into our lives, and our hearts are our entry into your life, into life itself. And so do the work through your word, by your spirit, on our hearts. It would be our prayer every weekend. It is our prayer this weekend. And we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. This is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5 is the Shema, it's called. And that's our taking off text uh, this morning. It's an unusual series for me. I'm used to just working verse by verse through chapter by chapter in a book of the Bible. That's preaching as I know it. This is another form of preaching that many, many, it's really not like total topical preaching, but it's, it's close to it or close enough to it for me. And so it's an unusual approach that really, in this case, in the study of the heart, involves the whole Bible. And the Shema is one of those linchpin verses for the whole Bible. It's central to Jewish faith, and it really is central to our faith as well. Shema means hear in Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the version that I memorized in the NIV. And that's what we're to do. Like, what am I supposed to do with my life? What's my purpose? What are my goals? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. That would always be the answer in the life of a person who is going after God. To love God. That's our purpose. Yet it can be hard. You know, when you're not happy with your life, when you're, when you're disappointed at what God has allowed in your life, it can be hard sometimes to worship him, to love him with all your heart. It can be hard when you feel like he's not doing a very good job at loving you. Now, of course, you don't think that. In our thoughts, we know that God is good all the time and he will never let us down. But in our hearts, well, in every one of our hearts, reality can be perceived very differently. How we feel can be very different than how we think. And when we feel distant from God, then we're limited by this. We're limited by the condition of our hearts. Everything really depends on the heart. And when our hearts are hardened to God for one reason or another, usually it's a circumstantial reason, when our hearts are hardened to God, then it's difficult. Now the truth is, how we feel about such experiences, about these, these seasons and, and how God has allowed them in our lives, those, those feelings have nothing to do with God. God has not changed. Though our relationship to him on our end seems to be strained for one reason or another. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And when we experience the temptation to loss of heart, the hardening of heart, our hearts breaking, our hearts condemning us, when we experience that, God cares. God notices. He wants to minister to us. He cares about our hearts. They are his entry point into our lives. So Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 The Shema, it is preceded by the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 6, Shema, Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 5, the chapter before. Two places in the Bible where you find the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, so the second book, chapter 20. Or the fifth book, Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
That's kind of cool, right? 2 and 20, there's a 10 that you can work out there. And remember that the Ten Commandments are there, second book, 20th chapter. Or 5 plus 5 equals... 5 plus 5 equals... Yes, confident. I like that. Yeah. The Ten Commandments. You'll have no other God before me. You shall not make or worship idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Four, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Five, honor your father and your mother that, I get, that it may go well with you in the land that I am giving you. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And ten, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, the Ten Words. You cannot overstate the influence of the Ten Commandments on human civilization. Of course, the communities of God have the Ten Commandments at their center. This is how you live life. This is the righteous life defined. The, the, the boundaries and borders of righteousness are sketched out here by these ten words. And you find, as you look through history, that wherever there is righteousness, where the, wherever there is a code or a law or a rule of some sort or another that works, that helps, that limits evil and promotes good, you can trace it back to the Ten Commandments. What do we do? And I've done a couple sermon series on the Ten Commandments. And one or two of them I've done working our way backwards. Ten, nine, eight, all the way to one. What do we do, Ten Commandments? How or why is in the, the, the next chapter. It's in the, what we call the Shema. And I've added a verse here. I added verse 6. And this is not in the NIV that I memorized it in, but in the ESV that's in the, the Pew Bible that you, you might have with you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. So our work, our, our walk with Christ, it all starts in the, the heart. It is work from the heart. The Bible mentions the heart 850 times, but we know indirectly many more times. And throughout the Bible, we see that the heart is something we're to guard, we're to protect or to tend to. One famous verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. And this is from 4 through 7 of chapter 4. Many of us know this or some version of this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the version I memorized it in the NIV, 1984. There it is, though. What's the great prize? What's the great task that God accomplishes through our faith, through our not being anxious? Our hearts are guarded. Because it, it, what happens to your heart is what happens to you. If you're having trouble in life, you're having trouble with your heart. The circumstances come and go. They're, they're going to be what they're going to be. We all know people who have circumstances that we covet. We're not supposed to do that, but we do. We covet their circumstances, and yet they're miserable. Their hearts are hardened, shriveled. And we all know people who have circumstances that frighten us. Oh, Lord, I hope I never have to go through what this person is going through circumstantially. And yet we know it is well with their souls. It is well with their hearts. And we know they're going to be okay. And they're in a good place. This is not about being happy. I think many of us think that. We think, that, you know, I, I want to be happy. And that's, that's what life is about. And the Bible really leaves happiness in the dust. In fact, sadness is often embraced in place of happiness. When it comes to our hearts and, and for the higher goals of, of purity and peace. Let me show you this verse. James 4, 
8 through 9. Right before this, he's talking about resisting the devil. Now he says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Some of you just felt included because you're wretched. <laughs> yes, I'm, there's a place for me. Yes. And there's a relief that we feel when we read verses like this because there seems to be such a, a passion in human culture for continual happiness all the time or whatever that is. Here's another verse that says about the same thing in a different way from Ecclesiastes. Sorrow is better than laughter for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. So it's not about the smile on your face. That's not the barometer that we can rely on to determine how you're doing. It's about the condition of your heart. And sometimes the way you look, the way you appear, the way your face appears has nothing to do with your heart. And sometimes we judge people based on how they look. Do they look happy? And of course, don't we know that lots of people who look happy aren't happy? And lots of people who don't look happy, we find out are. It was years ago, it was a worship leader who's, who's moved on, but he was here as a worship leader, and he loved leading worship. And he would notice certain people in the congregation, and, and one man he noticed, this man, I'm not sure, if, I think he was an older man, this man, he, uh, he would just stand there during worship and grimace. He wouldn't sing, just stand there, staring forward. And the worship leader would notice him and, and be a little discouraged by that and want him to engage. And like, well, it's, I'm not getting through to him. It's not working. He's not having an experience that I believe God has called me to help him to have. He's not connecting with you. He's not lifting his voice and praise and worship. He's just standing there with that thing on his face. You know, well, what's wrong with him? And then, one Sunday, the man approached the worship leader, and told him, I got to tell you, that's my favorite part of the worship service. This is the part I need. And I just want to thank you for what you do. You really help me connect with God. Yeah. Some of you are clapping because I just told your story. <laughs> right? And you're loving that verse, aren't you? And that's somehow how the Bible corrects culture, the Bible corrects human experience. Our human experience is so fractured and, and frustrating, and then the Bible fills in the holes and the gaps and shows us uh, the breadth of our hearts and the purpose of our hearts and how life works. It is a matter of the heart. The Bible portrays human flourishing as that which proceeds from the heart. So if your heart is different, then your life will be different. If your heart is changed, then your life will be changed. If your heart is renewed, then your life will be renewed. If you're disappointed in life, disappointed by what God has allowed in your life, then he wants you to channel that back into your heart. Work on your heart. Diagnose your heart. And... Look to see what in your pain that your heart is going after. You have pain, and what is that motivating your heart to go after? That's what matters. Because the heart that goes after God is the heart that generates a life. God uses that heart. He generates a life from that heart that serves him. That's powered by him. That's protected and guarded by him. This service, this life is imperfect but inevitable. This life in God that's generated in our hearts by the Spirit. And I, I love the way the Bible tells us the story of David over and over again. Here's one sample from Acts 13. Paul is saying this about David, quoting 1 Samuel 13:14. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, 
a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. That's the thing that matters. So despite David's sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, he was able to repent and serve God in life far better than Saul before him or Solomon after him because his heart went after God. He had a heart after God. So I look at this. I look at the the whole counsel of Scripture when it comes to my heart, and I know that the path out of my losing heart starts with me facing my sin and sinfulness, my brokenness, my weariness, my failure, and whatever has caused me to lose heart or be tempted to lose heart, and then gather what's left of me and my life and return it to the basic function of my heart, loving and worshiping God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Always heart first on the list. Jesus quotes this when he's asked, what's the great commandment? And then we're adding the next verse. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. His word does its work in and on your heart or it has no impact on your life at all. That's, you, you, you read the Bible not with your eyes but with your heart. And God speaks to your heart through his word by his spirit. So, Yes, this is the purpose of life. This is one of the most important sets of verses in the Bible when it comes to the heart and our purpose in life and the why. Why do we do the Ten Commandments? Why obey? What's behind that? Our love for God, a love relationship that we are to have with our Lord God. But to get back to the dilemma we started with, when when we're disappointed, when It's difficult to love God, to worship God, because we've lost heart or our hearts are broken. What do we do? And in looking at this, and this is one of the things that inspired the whole series, uh, there has to be a bookend verse. There has to be a verse that answers the question that this verse raises on my darkest days, on, on the days of my brokenness and failure and the days when I feel divided from God and divided from others. And, and there's several that we could look at. We're going to look at 1 John 3. And just, just as a bookend to our, our taking off place in this last of the five sermons. The Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Here's the bookend. John chapter 3, 1 John, written by the same man who wrote the Gospel of John. 1 John 3, starting in verse 19. Speaks right to the issue. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. So your path back, my path back from losing heart starts with God. And sometimes that is not the first thought we have. We feel distant from God. We feel like we have to work some things out before we go to God. Whenever you feel like you have to work some things out before going to God, immediately rush to God. Drop the project. Drop the self-improvement. Drop it and go to God. Just drop it to the ground and run to Him. He is the only one who can do his work in your heart. If there's distance between you and him and a perception of distance, well, eliminate it. With whatever power you have to eliminate it. The the power of your relationship with God, that's in God always. But run to him, rush to him. Sin tells us to do the opposite. Sin tells us to hide Sin tells us to justify. 
to, to come up with a story, a narrative that explains why we, because we're special, did what we did. Because our circumstances are special, unlike anyone else's. Drop all that. It's exhausting anyway. It's part of, what you're, it's part of why you're tired. It's part of what makes you weary. Me too. Let's drop all that and run to him. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. He continues. The next verse is, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So this is the issue. You want a heart that doesn't condemn you. If our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So we're going to live that life described for us in Deuteronomy 5 for the reason given to us in Deuteronomy 6, specifically 6, 4, and 5, the Shema. We can do that. How? Look at this. It goes right back to basic gospel in the next two verses. And this is his commandment. All the commandments summed up into one. All the, the law. All What do I do? What is the Bible telling me to do? And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. It comes back to that. Love God, love someone else. Pour out your heart to God. Pour out your heart to God through pouring out your heart in your relationship to those people that God has put you close to and has put close to you. Those people in your life. Those people you come across. Love is the, the verb of the Christian life. The heart is made to love. So your heart is not engaged in love then that's why you're losing it. That's why it's condemning you. That's why it's growing hard there in your chest. Love. Whoever keeps his commandments, the next verse, abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. And so... It brings us back to the question, you know, can, I, can I do this? Can, can I please God even though I'm broken? We get our eyes off of him and we get our eyes back on ourselves. Can I worship him even if I'm struggling to trust him? Again, how you feel about him has not changed who he is. It has not diminished his word in any way. It has not canceled any of his promises. Can I honor him with dirty or bloodied or bruised hands? A Christian writer and pastor from the last century, A.W. Tozer, wrote this. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. For all people, men and women, boys and girls. What are those crowns about? And the three by five card? Well, get those out. You didn't lose them, I hope. Now somebody did. You can just get up and go get one. Just, it's a no judgment zone. So you might think this is silly. You might know what this is. Don't give it away. Um, maybe it, this, doesn't, this won't work for you. But maybe it will work for someone else. This is something that you can offer to someone else, perhaps. It recruits all your senses. And many of you may not be aware of the, the emotional impact of a crayon it can be surprising we're not aware of it whenever I see a crayon I immediately have a whole flood of emotions everyone told me you know just that when our, our kids came along you know hey these are these days are going to go by quickly and 
I thought, you are insane. I have not slept for two months. You know what? Just hang on. These, these days are going to go by so quick. Okay. <laughs> what are you trying to tell me? Is that good news or is that a warning? It was a warning. And they were, tr they, they were accurate. They went by quickly. So I've got one that's got a year left. And how did that happen? And if you, you have your kids, now you have your grandkids come in. And now there's, there's more emotion there with the crayons. So, and some of us don't have any emotion. We think it's silly and there shouldn't be crayons in church ever. Well, you're in the wrong church. Because <laughs> we, we just can't, it's, it's, it's raining crayons around here. All right, so you got your, you got your, you got your crayon, your three by five card. That's step one. Okay, here's step two. Break your crayon in two. Yeah, I know. It's just like life, isn't it? There it is. And all those memories. It's, I love a perfect crayon. And I've got my share of broken crayons in my life too. Okay, now uh, I'm going to ask you to write a four-word sentence uh, with uh, a piece of your broken crayon on the three-by-five card. So you're going to have to maybe prepare that, that piece, maybe peel some paper or whatever. And uh, here... Here it goes. So here's the first word. Broken. Go ahead and write that there. Broken. Second word. Crayons. Broken crayons. Third word. Still. And the fourth word, color. Broken crayons, still color. My friend and uh, soon retiring fellow chaplain, Bob Tilly, he took this picture, road sign in New Jersey, and you might have heard the, the, the four word sentence before, but. He saw this as a sign from God. If you know him, you know that he's had, in some ways, a tougher time in life than most. And he saw this as a sign from God in that moment. And maybe, maybe you do too. It means the same thing. It's, and, the, and this note that you made, you can put it on your fridge. You can keep it there in your Bible. You can share it with someone else. Just make sure you know it's true. Broken crayons, still color. You know, and in the midst of all those 850 verses on the heart, there's this, this verse from Psalm 51. Now, Psalm 51 is the psalm that David wrote when he was coming clean, if you will, with God after his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and after Nathan had called him out by assignment from God, you are the man. And sometimes when somebody comes to me, and I, I think some of the other pastors do the same thing in the church, but we, we all have people who will come, they've been caught in adultery, they've, they've been caught stealing from work, uh, whatever legal troubles they're in now have been found out, and now things are going to proceed openly and no one knows yet and they're there, they're sitting together, they're broken. What do I do? What do I do now? And I will often say, well, here, among the things that I, I'm going to recommend, I'm going to suggest, I, I'm going to offer you is that you, you, you um, make Psalm 51 your companion for the days and weeks to come. So I want you to get into Psalm 51. I want you to read it. I want you to read it out loud. I want you to write it out in pen or pencil. Go verse by verse. Just let David walk you through his confession. Look at every word, what every word means. And this is near the end of that, that psalm. Because David here is confessing his sin. And 
even as he does that, and this is especially important, even as he does that, he's upholding the character of God, the merciful character of God. The, the character of God that we find, that we discover in the pages of Scripture. The God who came up with the idea of salvation and reconciliation and forgiveness. He invented it. His idea. That God. And David says this in his psalm. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Broken crayons still color. And even if you feel like you've lost heart. Or, or your heart is condemning you for one reason or another. Here's what you do next with that, with that broken crown, with that broken heart. You can do this next in Christ. And there it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Here's what you do. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. He became broken for us. He was not broken. No one was more whole ever. No human being more whole than Christ Jesus. And he became broken because we were all broken and had no path to, to God. No, no way to get to God. No way to get to being whole. The word shalom incorporates the the concept of being whole, of being complete. It's the word that also means peace. We had no way to that except that he would be broken. At a memorial service just a few days ago, I spoke about how he dresses our wounds with his wounds. How he helps us with death through his death. He enables us to take heart. He restores our hearts like no one else, like nothing else. Go to him. Take your brokenness. And just don't, don't work on it. Don't, don't, don't follow seven steps. Just go directly to Christ. Father, we want to do that now. We want to go to your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We seek him in this moment. And we, we have these broken crayons and they remind us of broken things that are precious for many of us. Uh, Lord, that makes us think of you and the broken thing that you became for us on the cross. So Lord, uh, thank you for this. Help us to, to, to follow you, to lean on you, so that we may finish our race and not lose heart. Thank you, Jesus. In your mighty name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen.